Hello guys again. So last time, in the previous lecture, we were discussing type of loads. Now we're going to keep going and we're going to talk about philosophies of design. Philosophy of, the, of design from the point of view of, okay, now we have those loads. What are we doing with those loads? How are we going to use those loads for uh, producing our final type of structure? Basically, there are two uh, philosophies of design that we are going to be using or gonna, we're going to be working uh, with and one of them uh, is uh, the one that we are going to be making more emphasis because it's the newest one. The first one is called Working Stress Design or it's called ASD. ASD stands for Allowable Stress Design. That has been used for more than a hundred years and the second one is called the Limit State Design or LRFD. LRFD stands for load and resistance factor design. That was first introduced in the US around uh, 1986. However, uh, it was used in Canada, I think, uh, before that. And it's called limit states because it's based not on failure of the structure, but on the limit states. And it's just semantic, because if you, if you remember what we discussed about limit state before, limit states is just a set of conditions at which any structure uh, just cannot uh, function like it was designed. Basically, that's it. And there are different type of limit states, and I I would suggest you to go and check the previous lecture. I have pictures here everywhere, and we discuss limit states. Uh, there are basically two types: the ones that implies safety itself, and the other ones that I define as a comfort uh, limit state. And the safety ones is yielding, rupture, fracture, stability, overturning, sliding, drifting, etc., etc., etc. Everything that in, can induce a collapse in the structure. Uh, the second type of limit state, which is called serviceability, and I put here the formation, but it's not only the formation, it's the formation, deflection, vibrations, etc., etc., etc. So you have the deflection, vibration, corrosion, and then we discuss corrosion. Oh, but corrosion should be here because. It, go to the previous lecture and, and see what we discussed over there. So, but it is just a refresher now. So how the ASD works? ASD basically, as everything, is result of experience and judgment. And there are safety factors, but these safety factors are just based on experience, more than research, purely experience. And they have been unaltered for the past almost 80, 90 years, you say here 75, but since the beginning probably of the introduction of these, they, they move it a couple of times and that's it. So one factor of safety handles everything. Basically what this formula is establishing here, is showing here, is that this is the capacity of the section. This is how much the section can absorb, can take of a particular action, for example, how much tension, how much torsion, how much moment can absorb the section, how much stress. So basically this here is just that. The capacity of the section, we're going to reduce it by a factor of safety. Obviously, if we are reducing it, this is bigger than one. And the reduced capacity has to be bigger or equal than the acting loads. That's what it says. The acting loads, we are not going to touch them. We're going to use them as is. Whatever value of the load, this is is. This is the one that we will be using here, except that we're going to combine them. And sometimes, but we're not going to increase the values of the loads. Sometimes we reduce some values of the loads, accounting for the possibility. And I don't like to in introduce here the word possibility or probability, but it's true. Uh, the, how all the forces can act at the same time, meaning, I'm going to show you there. Well, this is basically the same thing. A member is selected so that the maximum stress due to working working loads is not going to exceed the allowable stress. The allowable stress is the capacity reduced by the factor of safety. So the uncertainty here, once again, in ASD is handled by only one factor of safety. And that factor of safety is going to reduce the capacity, period. That's it. We don't modify the loads. This is the load combinations, or there was the load combinations. I don't know if they changed in, in the last modification. I don't think so. 
I think this is up to date. So basically you just get the loads or the actions from those loads, dead plus live, and then you have dead plus, this is a roof live load or a snow load or rain load. That means that if you realize, this is basically not one equation. This is one, two, and three equations, D plus LR, D plus S, and D plus R. Same thing happens here. And then you have, but if you realized, if you check, we don't have any value that is bigger than one increasing the loads. So this is the way you combine loads. And then you take that, you assume all of them, all the possibilities that can happen there for every single one of the, the combinations, and then you go with the biggest or the worst possible effect. That's what you do. Anything wrong with the allowable stress design method or philosophy? Why then we have to change it? I don't know. If you check these structures, all of them were built with ASD and they are still there. That doesn't mean they are optimum, but listen, they have been there for quite some time and probably they will be there for a longer time now. Okay. Now, LRFD, load and resistance factor design. As I say, it was introduced, uh, firstly introduced in 1986, uh, and late before that in, in Canada. And it's probability based, and that's important, probability based. So now, the uncertainties, and when I mean uncertainties is because uh, you assume that this section or this particular type of element can resist, let's say this, you have this type of beam here, right? Uh, and then you say, okay, this beam, we know for sure that can resist that much. Okay, you know that for sure, but what about the modulus of elasticity? Do you have any uncertainty when you calculate the modulus of elasticity? Are you using the modulus of elasticity of this particular element with this particular material or you're gonna use any standardized modulus of elasticity. So there's an uncertainty there. What about the fabrication process of this thing? You can have some errors in the fabrication that you don't see them, but they might be there. You might have residual stress. I don't know, there, you, you might have a bunch of things here that are uncertain, this is not for sure. So we are going to first reduce the capacity of the section based on that and then on top of that, we are going to increase the values of the loads. And the worst case scenario is gonna be handled by an, a, a reduction of the capacity of the load and an over, uh, under strength of the section. And then we're gonna have an overloading situation. The load increased by some reason. And this is what this is considering basically here. So we're gonna have factors for reducing the capacity of the elements, depending on the type of action now. Tension, for example, is gonna have a reduction capacity of 0.9. However, torsion or shear is gonna have 0.75. That's gonna be the factor. Uh, it's gonna change depending on what type of phenomena we are studying. And the reason is uncertainty, once again. The, the tension phenomena or the bending phenomena is mm, better defined, better known, and better understood than the torsion and shear. And it's more reliable, it's more, uh, yeah, that's the word, reliable. And then we're gonna increase the values of the loads at the same time, depending on the type of loads. And we discussed loads before, and this is what this equation says. The, reduc the reduction of the capacity or the reduced capacity of the section has to be bigger than the summation of all the loads acting, factor loads acting for in that, in that particular situation. Now, uh, I don't like to go into this because this is not topic for this particular class, but this is the way it's established. Basically what we want uh, is no other thing than this. You look at this, right? You see this here? This is the capacity, and this is the distribution of the capacities in a several, uh, in a normal distribution. With this is the mean of the capacity, and this is the mean of the loading here. 
and you can have underloading and overloading same thing in the capacity you can have under strength at an over strength that you are considering but this is the mean now this portion here is the one that is going to represent uh, the possibility of failure and it always exists now that's extremely 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 small if you if you check the two the two charts can we do something that these two uh, distributions do not intersect yes does it worth it i i don't know i don't think so uh, it's going to be extremely 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 expensive and it's not going to do the product that we need to based on the minimum probability of this happening here now if you look at this here now that makes sense but if you plot the logarithm and you make a variable distribution here a probability distribution and basically what you do is that you are making a distribution of the logarithm of the natural logarithm of the uh, capacity divided by the loading and you plot that this is the probability of failure here that's it the probability okay let me change that probability of failure no probability of exceeding the limit state and the distance between the zero and the mean which is expressed in terms of a beta factor that beta factor is the is called the reliability index the greater the beta the safer the structure is and that beta can be estimated by using these equations here but once again this is not a topic for this class I just wanted you to know if any anybody tells you about beta or you hear about reliability index now you know kind of what it means based on that and based on um, the specifications again and the load and resistance factor design combination for the loads are these ones here as you can see uh, this is basically the ASCE 716 by the way what is the meaning of ASCE okay very good answer go and investigate that if you don't know it 1.4 times dead load 1.2 dead load plus 1.6 live load plus 0 0.5 roof live load plus or snow or rain that means that once again this is not one equation this is this could be up to three equations one two one with the first second and third same thing here every time that you see an or that is another equation over there so in this case you have you know one two six equations for this part instead of one if you do all the combination that you can have here etc 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 now you see this 1.2 dead load 1.6 live load and what is the reason for that the reason for that is the way the loads are calculated remember we that we, we discussed this part before the dead load is the most known type of load why because it's just getting the volume getting the shape getting the the unit weight multiplying them together and that's basically it so it's something that you can calculate fairly easy now the live loads can be there or not be there can move can variate in intensity in location so those are also probability loads that's why we increase them by 60 percent just in case just because so imagine what we are doing for example in the case of torsion or shear we are in increasing the dead load by 20 percent we're increasing the live load by 60 percent on top of that we are reducing the capacity by 25 percent that's a lot of uh, factors of safety that we are including there and on top of that when especially when the engineers are new they over design everything because they think that uh, the thing can fail well of course they can fail but it's going to be really difficult with all the factor loads and reduced capacity that we are taking into account now i remember when i was uh, studying engineering this term was 1.4 and this term was 1.7 what does that mean that the loads got reduced with time no that means that we have a better understanding of the phenomena and then we can reduce those factors of safety or factors of uncertainty if you will and this is what they mean okay let's do an example here and let's try to wrap this uh, lecture first it says compute the required flexional strength for one end of a beam 
in a reinforced concrete frame. The moments produced by dead life and wind loads are these ones here. Okay, wait a second, but if you look at these, those are loads. And now if you look at these, those are moments. Oh, oh. So basically what this is telling me is that I can combine loads, but I think it's, at least in this case, and in the majority of the case, it makes more sense just to do the following. If we are in the linear elastic range, uh, it will be easier if we just calculate the effect. Let's say that this is the point that we're looking for, and these are the lateral loads, maybe the wind loads, and these are the results of dead loads or live loads, or dead loads plus live load factor already. And using the tributary area, using the distribution of the loads, and using influence lines that later on, and, and highways, for example. So alternating the live load in the spans, but they say this, these are the loads. So that means that I can calculate the wind loads and calculate all the moments everywhere due to those loads. And then I can use live loads and dead loads and calculate the moments also in the same point. And then I combine the moments. That's what this means. So then what do we do? We have these equations. We have these loads in particular. We have negative value here. We are close to the support. That makes sense. And then for the wind, we have positive or negative. That accounts because of the wind can blow in different directions and can produce different effects, let's say. They don't have to be the same effect, but in this case, they are. OK, these are the equations. These are the loads. So let's start. 1.4 times dead load. We are going to start considering first the negative bending. Remember, negative bending means we're going to have tension at the top, compression at the bottom. That's what negative bending is. And one of the things that I I just read it really quick, but it, it would be good to make you know a point in that. It says here reinforced concrete frame, and that's extremely important. Reinforced concrete frame. It's not that if it's a steel, it doesn't matter. But with, uh, when you have reinforced concrete, remember, positive and negative moment are going to have a huge, huge, huge influence and a huge difference in the way that you design. Negative bending. OK, the first one, 1.4 times dead low. This is it. Now, the second combination, we don't have anything here. We are not in the top, right? So right now, so it's only dead load and, and live load. And we get these values here. Perfect. And the third one is going to be less smaller than this one because we don't have this. And this is just L. And this is 1.6L. So it doesn't work to combine them. The fourth combination, 1.2 dead plus a moment plus a live. And then you have negative 370 kip. And what about this one? 1.2, we don't have earthquakes. 1.2.1, these and these are basically the same under our particular considerations. And what about this one? 0.9D minus, I'm going to use the minus one win. So this one is the first one, negative 290. And those are all the combinations. Out of all the combinations, this is the one controlling the design. So this is the one that I'm going to use to. Uh, determine my sections when we do the design. Now, for positive bending. Positive bending, remember, tension bottom, compression at the top fibers. That's what it means, positive bending. Uh, this is going to be negative because the load is producing a negative moment. This is going to be also negative here. So basically, uh, I don't have to include this or this or this. What about this one? OK, this one, the wind can be positive here. So if I include that and I put the positive win, I have 30 kip. What about this one? If I use this one, I have 110 kip per foot, where this will be controlling. If I have the effects interpreted correctly, like there, this will be the one controlling the design for positive bending. Now, what do we do with those maximum negative and maximum positive uh, moments? Then we use those for design. And remember, if we're going to be designing this in reinforced concrete, that's extremely that's of extremely importance because the negative moment, which is this type of uh, behavior, is going to produce tension on the top, meaning that is the one that I will be using for calculating the steel 
reinforcement that I need or that section needs in the top fibers. Now for positive bending, this is going to be the moment that is controlling and I will use that for designing the, con the steel reverse reinforcement at the bottom of the structure. This is a simple example, but it's a, it's a good starting point. Okay, next lecture, next video, we're going to start talking about load transfer process. Keep watching, guys. See you later. Have a good day, or night, or afternoon, or whatever.